Please welcome Peyton Maynard Caron. Howdy. First of all, thank you for having me. Um, I really like following up on Manish because at the beginning of his speech, or the beginning of his talk, he sort of highlights what I'm going to talk about. Um, but before we get to that, I want to share a short story. Uh, in 2011, my air conditioner died. And I did what everybody did, does. I went out and had some AC repairmen come to my house and tell me how much it was going to be to fix my AC. It was something like 17000 was the cheapest quote to fix my AC, up to 32000 Now, it was the middle of summer, so I knew they were gouging me. But I was immediately shocked. Like, how can it cost that much? Um, and I'm a pretty, pretty inquisitive guy, so what I decided to do was try to figure out why it cost that much. Well, the AC people had done me a really good thing at, at the beginning. They left me the brochures for all the types of equipment they were going to sell me. So I immediately took that to the web, Amazon, eBay, and everything, and figured out how much those pieces of equipment cost. It's going to cost $3,000 to buy a new AC system. When I figured that out, my wheels really started spinning. I'm like, how can it be this expensive? And I started doing all this research into AC systems. I started looking at the AC system in my house and how it actually been deployed. Um, my AC system was deployed in one of the most terrible ways. The number one rule about AC is airflow. You want to have unrestricted airflow because that means you cool faster, you use less energy, and your house is more efficient. When they'd installed my AC system to miss a beam by one inch, they had had literally put the air handler in a place where they had to come out of the air handler and do the first no-no, which is a 90 degree angle up, a 180 degree angle again to get around that beam, and then another 90, 90 degree angle into the air handling system. Killed the efficiency of the system, and they literally only had to move the system over one inch and put in a custom piece of uh, aluminum to make it work more efficiently. So I decided I'm going to do it myself. I went down to a sheet metal plant, I purchased all the devices, I got it all in place, I had someone install it, and for $4,000, I now had a system that worked 70% more efficiently and was saving me 30% on my summer months on my energy bill. It's amazing. Why does that matter? Because until that time, I looked at my AC system the way most software companies look at their networks. I hit a button and I wanted the temperature to go down. I didn't know how to measure efficiency or cost or scale. I simply hit the button. And most companies have been doing that for a long time. But the ecosystem is starting to change. Most companies are recognizing that the efficiency and the scalability that they're receiving from their networks isn't meeting their requirements. In fact, in this year's Gartner poll, 96% of respondents want to move away from highly uh, siloed systems to open systems that allow them to do the same thing on multiple pieces of equipment. This means they don't want to just buy from Juniper or Cisco or Arista. They want to buy switches and configure them all the same way. And companies are also starting to recognize that the network is not providing them what they need, so they're starting to move operations away from the networking teams, outside of IT, and into software development teams and business teams that actually own that ecosystem and are required to be efficient at it. So why this shift? Why is the network ecosystem changing? Why are people moving away from our traditional vendors? Why are they moving to more open source systems? Well, we have to un understand the networking ecosystem to do that. And, and just to give you a little bit of my lineage, I've been doing this for 20 years. I've worked with every single major vendor. I've worked at Time Warner Cable. I've worked at Riot Games. I've built data centers, access systems, uh, software-defined systems. And I really, really do believe and I'm a network engineer at heart, and I believe that network uh, the best software systems are only as good as the networks they're built on. But even I've started to recognize that most businesses really don't understand or value their networks correctly, and that networking has not gotten enough attention in the software revolution. And that means that the ecosystem that produces those network devices and the engineers that enable them have reached a tipping point where they're not providing enough value to those companies, and they're actually starting to slow them down meaning that it has to change or it's going to be unsustainable. Now, understand what we're talking about. Let's think about software engineers in the, in the, in the landscape of that AC system. You know, if I have a program or thing that I want to deliver to customers, I know software engineering. I know how to run software engineering teams. I know how to set up my servers and I know how to get them running. 
but I also have to have this thing that delivers them to my customers. I have to go buy routers. I have to go buy intrusion detection systems. I have to buy firewalls. I have to buy uh, load balancers. I have to buy spine switches. I have to buy tours. I have to make all this stuff work, so then I have to go hire network engineers, and I have to go hire security guys and people doing software for the network. I have to put a knock in place to make sure that it's working. And then I have a whole army of people that are managing contracts, depreciation, purchasing, all the things that go around it. And this isn't my core competency. This is not what I do every day. So I really don't even know if I'm doing it right. I'm having to put some trust into people that do something I don't understand. And then I have to also trust them to build it the right way. I have to look at them and say, can they translate what I want to do into a network that scales over time and prevents costs from spiraling and allows me to do the next thing as well? And let's talk about features. If you think about it, most devices out there have way too many features. This is the product sheet of a standard top rack switch. It has over 280 features and MIBs that have to be constantly updated and constantly maintained. Stuff I don't use, stuff I'm paying for as a, as a company, but not stuff that actually drives value for me. And in fact, it's going to be that I'm going to use less than 20% of those features, meaning I've got 80% of the feature stack in that switch that I'm paying for and I don't need that could actually impact the 20% that I do need if there's a code problem. And really, in general, I don't really understand why they're there. They're, they're part of a, a, a system that's just a bunch of tech debt to me. On top of that, if there's a new feature that I want, there's several ways I can get it. Either I'm Google, Netflix, Facebook, and I spend a lot of money, and people just build it for me because I spend a lot of money with them, and that works. Or I'm 99% of the other companies that are sitting there as a smaller org trying to influence features on devices that have to be, have to be monetized in the right way for the company to deliver them to me. That means I either have to have a whole bunch of other companies that want that exact same feature, or I have to go to places like the ITF, IEEE, Etsy, and try to create some reason for people to install it and get people on board. Problem with that is, I mean, we just saw OpenNFV uh, Open announce that Etsy had agreed to some of the things that they'd wanted for five years. Five years to install or create consensus around a feature being in your network device. Software looks at that and says, I will build that in a sprint as an MVP and iterate on it. And I'll allow people to adopt it if it provides value. If it doesn't, I'll kill it. And if it does, I'll continue to iterate on it to make it more value. But I'm not going to take five years to build something. On top of that, most of the companies we're talking about, Juniper, Cisco, Arista, everybody else, they all fight with each other. Who can think about all the differences in MPLS or RFC 3107, all the different things that had to be instantiated, were built in different ways, they weren't interoperable. So it really didn't provide much value to me as a network organization anyway, because I couldn't move from vendor to vendor and I couldn't use things in the same way over and over again. Bottom line, that whole ecosystem takes too long and it's too hard. And we're starting to see companies recognize that. Network spend has been on a downturn for a while, and it's continuing that trend. Now, let's think about network spend in, in, in common terms as well. How do I actually buy this stuff, and how complex is that? Well, if I'm a software organization and I want to buy networking equipment, I usually have to ask around and I find this thing called a VAR, a value-added reseller, who sell me a whole bunch of stuff. Now, that VAR usually has their favorite things they want to sell, because they sell for the most money. So they'll bring that sales guy to my office, and he'll bring a sales engineer, and they'll tell me about all the wonderful things they're going to do for me and how they're going to make me so successful. And then they'll hand me a sheet of paper that says, and this is how much it costs. And just like when those AC repairmen came to my house, I go, what the hell? That is a lot of money, and I don't even understand how that applies to my business case. Why does it cost that much? So we'll do some haggling, and then they'll bring in their vice president of sales. They'll cut me this great deal, and off we go to the races. But before we do, I realized I don't even have the network talent to make this happen, and that's where the VAR comes in and goes, hey, I got a whole army of people that can make you work great. By the way, they're free, because you're paying too much for your hardware in the first place, and they're not incentivized to actually provide you a solution that scales or is cheaper. They're not going to come to you and say, hey, you're using Juniper, but I think if you use Cisco, it'll cost less and be more efficient. Of course not. 
They want you to continue to buy the product they want to sell you, and they want you to continue to buy it linearly, meaning as I need more, I buy the same amount of equipment over and over again instead of scaling correctly. Basically, this ecosystem is great for stakes, golf, football games, and trips. But it is really bad for saving you money, making purchasing easy, transparency, or your company. I like that one. Uh, in general, this is too hard. And just like Netflix, most companies are recognizing this is not an ecosystem they even want to participate in anymore. That, that means that they are looking to providers to allow them to access the compute they want in a programmable way and distribute the thing they want in a, the same way every single time. And they want to cut the whole middleman network piece out of it. They want to be able to hire more pro programmers and they want to be able to provide more value. In fact, they're willing to pay six times more for that Amazon Web Service service than they are to their VARs simply because it means that they cut that whole ecosystem out of their lifestyle. And the proof's in the pudding. Amazon's making a lot of money. Microsoft's making a lot of money. Google's making a lot of money. In general, the cloud compute industry is a $157 billion industry. And these are just the top three, with Oracle and everybody else following behind because it's so rich. And it's even worse for the network engineering guys. The thing that used to make them really valuable, the network silicon they could produce, they don't even do that anymore. Most switches are built on uh, Broadcom chipsets using Trident or, tri or, or Tomahawk. We've got Jericho coming out. There's new entry into this market, Cavium, Barefoot, because that allows them to not have to focus on the hardware and provide you software features, again, which take too long. So one's got to ask, why don't I just buy my switches from these guys? Go to Edgecore, um, Celestica, Acteon, and develop software in a software engineering fashion that makes those things work that allows me to start thinking about things differently. If we think about it, a lot of the things that require FPGAs and ASICs, that's the firewalls, the IDS systems, and the load balancers, are starting to be able to be replaced through common compute. I can now use DPDK and load balancing at scale across common compute and not have to buy those specialized devices, which means I can now build back into my software engineering core competency and not have to worry about those specialized devices. I can now actually start deploying switches in my data center using Puppet and Chef. And by the way, you know all those things are Linux servers, right? They actually bash into a CLI that allows it to look like a network device, but it's a server. Everything translates back to that. So why aren't I using those features in the, in the Linux backend? Only thing that's left up there that's red are the routers. Oh, wait a minute. Sorry. Fastly and other companies are already starting to use common switching and moving features into compute so they can get rid of specialized routers as well. Those things are gone too. In general, the need for specialized devices and switches being deployed like servers means that the whole ecosystem around that changes. And, and look, there are companies out there that are going to help make this happen. I can look at companies that I pay, like v a VMware. I can look at companies that I participate in, like Calico. I can look at open source ecosystems like SnapRoute and Platina, all allowing me to drive more value and more efficiency out of my network because now I have a network that's operated by software engineers, not managed by network engineers. So there's six things we should probably take from this. In general, the network ecosystem has become very fragile and is way too slow moving. We're not providing the value and the features we need fast enough. Network ecosystem has become hard for most comp companies to participate in. They don't really know how to change it to operate in it. It's way too obscure and archaic. They're actually deferring their spend over to Google and Amazon, uh, allowing them to move faster and continue to build on the core competencies they want to have, which is delivering their service, versus, del versus working on uh, uh, devices they consider you know, things they're supposed, they've been told to have. More specialized devices can be removed. DPDK is allowing that. And the problem also is networking has tried to solve too many problems in too complex ways. There was this product that Cisco had. It was like a cloud product. Does anybody know what its name is? Nobody does. They spent $2 billion on it. They had one paying customer because it was too archaic. It was too complex. Nobody could really use it. And everybody could launch into Amazon right away. On top of this, our religious viewpoints have really gotten in the way of actually making ourselves efficient. Um, 
software is agnostic in the sense that they want you to understand multiple languages and that's what makes you a valuable software engineer. Networkers are like, I'm a Juniper guy. I'm a Cisco guy. Where's the guy? What? I was actually talking to a company where they had to change from one vendor to the other. And, the, and it was because the, their first vendor couldn't meet the scale requirements they had. Eight of their engineers quit. They said, I can't work with vendor B. I don't like them. What? Like, would you see software engineers quitting because you use Dell servers versus HP servers or moving to open compute? No. This system that has created an ecosystem where we fight against each other and we slow each other down has started to move more responsibility into software domains and into business domains and is really starting to create the, I won't say end of network engineering as we know it, but it's going to get extremely different. In general, to summarize, over the last 25 years, innovating for legacy vendor switching systems and routing systems has become a euphemism for adding more complexity. That won't work. People want to move faster. They want the systems to scale. They don't want to have to continue to buy more and more. This means the network industry ecosystem is completely ready for disruption. This is a time where we will see more companies building things that people adopt versus they buy it because it's a standard that was ratified. Inclusion, this is from a network engineer. I think we have to be ready for that change. We have to start building out systems and start looking at how we scale to be able to be on-prem, off-prem, but all driven by software and start realizing that the world is not network engineering, it's software engineering that runs the network. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.